All right, and welcome everyone to the eighth session of Amalfia. I actually don't have any announcements today, other than the fact that today will hopefully be a science-centric episode, because we haven't had one of those really yet. So, uh, we're just going to go ahead and jump right into it, and I believe, Bishop, you have the opening log. Indeed. Captain's log, stardate 62956.9. The successful repulsion of the unknown aliens that followed Dragon Squad back to the Gamma Quadrant has had a surprisingly positive effect on the fleet. Although the sudden surprise attack certainly shook the crews, it's been hard for them to stifle the giddy adrenaline fueled excitement of staring down the more of an alien capital group and forcing them to retreat with minimal casualties. Study of the captured bomber is ongoing, and I expect the research team's initial assessment sometime in the next day or so. The real excitement has been focused planet side, however. The Marissa Ambassador has just informed me that the final pre-launch checks have been conducted for the Marissa's new spacecraft. They're keeping the exact details close to their... Uh, chests? Mantles? Under wraps, either way. But based on the specs they have shown us, it will likely be comparable in power and capability to a 22nd century Columbia class. Given that we've been here less than two months, they must have been working on this project for years before we ever arrived. A revelation that reassures me on a personal level. The launch is scheduled for later today, and I intend to make an afternoon out of it. The captain's yacht on this ship still needs breaking in, and this is as good an excuse as any. I've even extended an invitation to Xenixia to join me. I know she'll be thrilled to see this in person. <clears throat> Before all that, however, I have a responsibility to uphold. A personal responsibility. It's clear now that Skull's condition is going to be long term. I've been holding out faint hope that Priya would be able to pull some kind of last-minute miracle, but I can't put it off any longer. As the wife of the Admiral, Vetu needs to know exactly what's going on. All right. So, uh, we are actually going to... Oh, yeah, to... oh, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to make sure. Uh, so, we are actually just going to uh, jump right into that scene. So... Uh, as you are, uh, you know, walking towards the quarters, Murthrin, uh, is there anything in particular that uh, you'd like to accomplish before you uh, step into uh, what is the Admiral's, uh, well, the Admiral's room, as it were? Uh, nope. Okay. All right. So, uh, you go ahead and you... Uh, step up to the door, uh, you chime the door, and uh, since uh, she's your character, McCall, I'm going to let you play her. All right. Um, the door opens automa Door opens after a short pause. Um, that's, I think, the first time I've actually seen this set. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, it smells f uh, faintly sweet, but... Um, uh, aromas of uh, freshly blossoming flowers are on the air and there's all sorts of the quarters are oddly split there's a side of artistic paintings and whatnot and a sign the other side is filled with technical diagrams and um, specs of old Romulan ships Vetu is busy just sitting down and having a cup of tea oh. Captain, do come in. Thank you for visiting. Can I offer you something? Uh, no, no, thanks. Uh, I wish this was under better circumstances, but... Uh... Yes, I've been down daily to see him in cryostasis, and that doctor of yours is a hard worker, but it doesn't take a Romulan who's been on the other side of a Tal Shiar interrogation to understand that he's not telling me everything. I don't suppose I don't you're here to tell me something that he's not? Uh, to an extent. Uh, I mean, there is going to be a representative from the uh, Symbiote Commission getting here at some point in the future, but for now I'm here to tell you that until for... Uh, Unless something happens, his condition is 
essentially permanent. Uh, she puts um, she puts the tea down, and despite trying to maintain a neutral face, her your uh, empath, you can obviously tell that there's a bit of devastation and a bit of relief. Yeah. Frankly, it's a case of there's no way for us to tr- attempt treatment or surgery or anything in a way that won't immediately risk that either the life of Skull or the symbiote. Hmm. I see. Part of me just wants to pick this... Hmm. Sh- I pick up a coffee cup and in a brief angry shout throw it against the wall letting the mm, steaming liquid just sort of pool on the carpet so, <sighs> Mertzman sort of winces very slightly but keeps his, <sighs> keeps an even expression right okay I don't know what I'm going to do anymore Savrick the I uh, the the Admiral saved me from a fate probably worse than death and granted me amnesty within this Federation, and now I'm out here, surrounded by Federation, your people in Starfleet uniform who, despite all attempts to appear polite and whatnot, I can tell that they view, some of them view me with the same amount of hostility as the Romulans on that Hulk you call a, uh, Warbird. And, the, mm, and don't think people. I've forgotten. And don't think I've forgotten about them either. <sighs> oh, they—they ha- they have not let me forget. Yes, I set foot on that ship only two times before. It was painfully clear uh, by Drake that I, for my own safety, I not set foot on it again. Mm. Yeah, he's uh, warned me off in no uncertain terms as well. <laughs> Uh, you got to admire a man who a pre who uh, f- follows his duty, though. Anyways, <laughs> so uh, until Skull goes somewhere, I'm staying here. I'm, yeah, and Mathur nods. That's a uh, sort of from an administrative point. I will be taking over as Commodore of the Fleet, but uh, as the, as uh, Skull is not uh, actually beyond hope. He remains the Admiral. And you remain the Admiral's wife. Yes. So you're not taking these quarters, mister. I do like... I've made at least half of it home. <laughs> what little I can. Um, I would like to be useful, though. Um, is there some roles I could fill somewhere? Like, I can lead a team somewhere. I'm good with engines. This whole dilithium chamber matter antimatter stuff is a little different than the quantum singularities that I'm used to but I could be some help somewhere I just let me do something please uh, out of character can I think of anything like off the top of my head that needs like a help of an expert in like engines mm. I'll just see. say make something up I mean I'll go with whatever. <laughs> with whatever. True. Um, hmm. You have this. You have this. I've heard rumors that you have a uh, captured technologies. On uh, yes, on the uh, we managed to secure one bomber from the alien fleet. Uh, I do have a science team on it, but uh, well, it is very alien design and you know a- and actually come to think of it and Mothran sort of considers Veta for a bit no I'm thinking a fresh look from outside the Federation might be quite helpful yes it's I, I was a leader in the field of advanced warp theory within the Romulan Science Bureau before the military recruited me and quite frankly, quite your Starfleet uh, science, scientists and engineers are very brilliant, but they've only worked on Federation technology. I may have a and, few tricks up my sleeve. 
And these aliens do seem to rely on, rely entirely on QSD for faster than light travel. So, if anything, you're probably more qualified to voice an opinion than the rest of us. I give I affix Mirthrin with a fairly long, steady glare, uh, emotionless glare. I'll reach under the coffee table, find a com badge, stick it on, and say. Specialist Vetu reporting for duty, sir. Uh, who is my... Who shall I report to? Uh, and also smile and tap his comm badge. Cap- Captain Merthrin to uh, science, team, uh, science Team Delta. And Delta, just Delta here, sir. Go ahead. Of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, you have. Captain Merthrin to Science Team Delta. Uh, I have a, I have a specialist that I'm going to send down to you to help you with your examination of the alien craft. Understood, sir. We will be expecting them. Yeah, they should be down momentarily. <laughs> I'll s- stand up, smile, and nod. And before he went into stasis, Captain, the Admiral did in. The Admiral did invite the command staff to this, to uh, his place for dinner. That offer is still open if you wish to take it, if you and the crew wish to take it up on, take him or me up on it. I think we might do that. And Mercer will sort of hold, hold out his hand to shake. I will, I will raise my hand ever so quickly to, to give the live long and prosper thing and then dive in and shake it out. Uh, shake the hand. If you ever need anything, don't hesitate to ask. Believe me, sir, you and Prier will be the first to know. I would like my husband back, but there's... that's being worked on. Yep, and I guess they'll both leave the quarters together. Mm-hmm. All right. So, a uh, small time skip. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, tell me a little bit about the captain's yacht. Um, how would you describe it, per se? Hmm. I'd say, like, a, probably a longer, more sort of swept, streamlined version of the Enterprise D yacht. Because, like, it's a, it's a Jupiter class, so, like, space isn't as much of a consideration. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking, like, sort of a spot. I, I'm thinking it, like, shoots out of a slot, like, behind the top of the... Thi- ah, what's it called? You've got the main hull, and then there's the little oval thing on top. Oh, like this saucer? Yeah. Yeah. So like, like, sort of cu- comes out from behind there. Okay. Uh, and well, well, capability wise probably mm, ge- general shuttle capability like uh, let's say Argo sure uh, so my question is uh, who else are you inviting to view the event uh, via the captain's yeah. yacht um, Zenixia for a start uh, who else would be a g- who else would be a good one mm, probably the ambassador okay I'm just trying to think. Uh, out of character, any one's characters slash NPCs who would really like to get a first row seat? Hmm. Can I go come along if you don't mind? All right. Well, well yeah. It's Nixia. That makes sounds good. Okay. You know, she's floating around somewhere. Yeah, I'll find her eventually. Um, okay, uh, anyone else that would uh, like the quote-unquote first row seat, as it were? Prayer will come. Prayer will come, alrighty. Sounds good. Alright, so of course everyone in the fleet is privy to this information. It's just that uh, we'll focus on these five um, as, uh, yeah. So, I'm actually going to momentarily put us on uh, the map of the planet. So, uh, Mirthrin, you, uh, would you personally pilot the captain's yacht out, or would you have some uh, some random... I think, I think he would, yes. Okay. 
So uh, you fly out uh, into orbit around uh, this planet, and uh, right off your uh, port side is uh, the starbase. And the starbase is co currently coordinating uh, pretty much all the small craft in the area. Uh, since its completion, the small craft in the area has increased tremendously. Um, I would say that on average, there's anywhere between 10 to 25 uh, ships just coming and going, not only from the planet, but between ships and the fleet. Uh, you know, it actually seems like a major hub, if that makes any sense. Um, mm -hmm. um, but uh, what happens is you get the call, uh, and the ambassador kind of turns to you and says, uh, they are now ready to launch, sir. If you will uh, look over there, and she points out, uh, we'll say, the front window at uh, a certain continent, or, well, not a continent, certain certain atoll uh, on the planet, and she says, we will be hopefully able to see it launch from there. It should be visible. And yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, you hear... Uh, sort of relayed to the whole fleet. You hear the countdown of a Marissa controller uh, counting down to launch, and you know it does the T minus 10, 9, 8, etc., etc., until the launch is given. And you are able, even at this distance, uh, to make out that a light, a very bright light, uh, illuminates the atoll and uh, begins streaking up out of the atmosphere towards you. And it takes maybe five, ten minutes before the ship comes into range enough for you to get a, a sort of a feeling for what the ship is like. Um, so for those who aren't on stream or unable to look at a screen, uh, the Marissa's ship is a very curved and almost, I would say, almost squid-like in design. Uh, it has uh, what is essentially an oblong body. Uh, with two sort of appendages or wings that taper off uh, that lead back towards where the engines are. Uh, interestingly, uh, the top of the craft is raised up and almost mirrors the Amalthea's uh, top hangar bay where it sort of launches uh, some of the fighter craft from. And it's very easy to tell looking at that sort of raised section that this is indeed a carrier-type vessel. Um, but, uh, everyone that you're hearing is celebrating the launch, uh, the ship, uh, the MS Atlantis, as the Marissa have called it, uh, is reporting all green, and, uh, you're actually getting a hail yourself, uh, Mirthrin, from the Atlantis. Atlantis, this is, uh, actually, to, uh, out of character, do Captain's Yachts have, like, names, or are they just Captain's Yachts? It's up to you. Okay. All right, uh, Atlantis. This is Captain Murthron on the US uh, on the USS Beagle. Come in. And uh, on screen uh, appears a Marissa. Uh, they are wearing, for whatever reason, they are wearing a uh, a set of epaulets, or I think that's what they're called. Sort of the uh, the string things you put on the shoulder. Um, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. So uh, they they appear on screen. Uh, like most Marissa, they are sort of without the mouth and, you know, they're aquatic in nature. And interestingly, this one is more red in color. Uh, but the captain, uh, if she could smile, she would. Uh, but you hear them say, this is Captain O'Sheen of the MX-01 MS Atlantis. It's good to finally join you in space, Captain. Uh, an impressive uh, of launch from the, uh, quite impressive from here. Indeed, we're seeing green across the board. Honestly, we were expecting at least one or two flaws, but everything's performing admirably. And, uh... Based on... Looking at the design, a carrier? Indeed. Uh, at first, we were going to simply make a... Uh, shall we say a... A frigate, or a, a destroyer, something small. But... After seeing the Amalthea in action, we decided that perhaps there was some merit in a ship that could essentially act as a carrier. Well, uh, 
Allow me to be the first to welcome you to the galactic community. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we will be now commencing our shakedown cruise. Uh, we will be remaining in system. You are, of course, welcome to follow us along. Uh, but uh, hopefully within the next hour, we, we will be able to strike out into the unknown. Understood. Captain out. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ethan will sort of look over the ambassador and go, You sure you're terrestrial cousin's ambition? I'll give you that. Oh. And Nick, standing there with his hands behind his back, will nod to the ambassador and say, Congratulations on your people's achievement, and welcome to the galaxy at large. And uh, Ambassador Lena does, if she could smile, she would, and she nods at Pinek and says, Thank you, Captain, and you as well, Captain, nodding at Mirthrin. I see this as a starting point for something great. Well then, let's... Uh bring ourselves in line with the Atlantis and get ready to join them on the cruise. All right. So, while that's going on, uh, Beckett, you get one of those calls from uh, High Long that says, uh, you know, maybe come to Stellar Cartography when you've got a moment. It's not an urgent call like when you first, you know, showed up in the Gamma Quadrant, but it's one of those that there's enough urgency in it that you probably want to do it sometime soon. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll turn to look at Ty in full battle combat gear and go, well, sorry, Commander, it looks like I'm needed somewhere else. That drill's going to have to wait a little bit longer, and he walks into the turbo lift. (laughs) I love how we keep blowing off the hostage training. Like, we keep finding ways to avoid it. It just sounds like something that would happen. Clearly not going to come to fight him in the butt. One day, Captain. One day. day. Oh. So anyway, uh, you do arrive in short order at uh, what is essentially High Long Sanctum, Stellar Cartography. And uh, when you walk in, you see that Stellar Cartography is currently charting uh, the current system that you're in, which we really need to come up with a name for. Um, But it's currently charting the the system, and there's an object uh, that you see that is sort of intersecting the system at a right angle. Uh, and as you come in, High Long uh, motions for you to come over and says, Ah, uh, yes, Captain, I've found something that I believe you and the rest of the fleet will be very interested in. Is it good news, or is this more bad news? Oh, no, no, I think this is uh, definitely good news. Uh, see here, and the sort of holographic <clears throat> display of stellar cartography zooms in on that same object, and you see what is essentially a rogue planet that is about the size of Pluto. And Hylong describes, I picked this up a few hours ago, and it's taken me until now to confirm that it is indeed a a rogue planet and not just some comet or ball of rock. Uh, Interestingly, sir, I believe it has a Class M atmosphere. And perhaps more important is that it has potentially rich deposits of cormeline, neranium, and benamite. Interesting. It would almost seem as this... Well, the old skeptic in me would say that this is too good to be true, that things that we could actually use are literally flying straight towards us. Indeed. I was a little bit suspicious myself, uh, but sort of neutral news, I suppose. Uh, If we wanted to sort of mine this planet, we would need to do something to quote-unquote capture it. Uh, At its current speed, it would only remain in this system for... Maybe a few days. Interesting. Um, I'll da- definitely uh, pass this along to uh, to Fleet. Um, can you continue to look at this thing's path and actually backtrack? See if... I don't know. Uh, this is your, uh, your wheelhouse, but... It, what caused it to go rogue and come across our path? I'm Again, sorry. I'm speaking as the old skeptic. No, I, I understand your concern, Captain, and I have been looking into that, but uh, my best guess is that, like most rogue planets, something happened to the star that it used to orbit, or uh, during the, the formation of a system, it simply was uh, flung out into space instead of being captured by a star or whatever was the anchor point for the system. Interesting. Um, 
Okay, uh, I'm gonna go back to the bridge and I'll have. Mm -hmm. us Drop it on the bridge. Kind of mirror. Well, I'm still talking to Hylong. I know. I know. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll get back up to the bridge and have us come along to a uh, kind of a, a following or pursuit course. Uh, let's run some more deeper scans to make sure that this isn't. That, that there's no surprises if we do decide to send a group down to it. Understood. Oh, and, and uh, I don't know if you saw this yet, and uh, she turns part of the hollow display to show a real-time image of the Atlantis. It's, uh, it's a rather pretty vessel. It is. And um, I, uh, I like the sentiment of them um, uh, making it into a more of a carrier. I think uh, I think certain skeptics would call that a violation of the, the prime directive, but uh, you know I, I see it as a, a welcome gesture. As do I, uh, especially for all the things that our two um, I would say species, but we are a lot of species, but our two groups are going to be doing for each other. But uh, keep the sensors cranked on this rogue planet. Um, give it a designation and um, I'll, I'll get you closer to it so you can take a better look at it. Roger that, sir. Um, and then Beckett will go back to the bridge um, not wanting to interrupt the uh, um, what's going on with the Atlantis. He will send a um, a message to the Amalthea not to, the, not to actually Mirthrin but to the Amalthea telling them basically everything Hylong just told him. Mm-hmm. And his course of action that he's going to take. Okay, so so you don't have to talk to yourself. We'll say that Gortek does get that information. Uh, what does Gortek do with that information? Um, probably send a text only to Mirthrin's uh, yacht. Okay. Um, and with also apologies of I I don't want to interrupt. Hence why I'm sending it text only. But here's all the information that the Lysithia has sent to us, and they're going to be investigating it further. Okay. So, you know, uh, Mirthrand uh, and the rest of you, uh, you know, at this point, the uh, Atlantis has been basically testing out its impulse engines. Uh, it's tested its sensors. Um, it's going to test its weapons in a few moments on a uh, just a stray ball of rock, but... It is at this point that at least one of you, and I'll let you decide amongst yourselves who that is, does notice that Mirthrin has a message waiting for him. Captain. Captain. Yes? It looks like we have a message from the Amalthea. Hmm. Curious. Sort of brings it up on the screen. Sort of reads through it. Eagle Eye Pineka peeks over his shoulder a bit. Hmm. I don't know, that is a serendipitous coincidence. <clears throat> Quite a convergence of probability. That is a rare phenomenon. Hmm. Yes. If you should wish, Commodore, the Ophion could move to assist the Lysithia with three tracker beams. We may be able to establish some sort of lock on the planet itself, depending on its size. Hmm. Yes, I'm like judging by the trajectory. Hmm. I mean, we'll need to run some simulations to make absolutely sure, but from the looks of things, we should be able to capture it into a stable orbit without affecting the gravity of the system too much. From what I understand, all it would take would be to nudge it into the gravity well of something larger. Zenixia speaks up. Um, sorry, can you share with the class, sir? Oh, yes, sir. Sorry. And he'll sort of, like, transfer the message onto the co-pilot screen. There's a rogue planetoid with a lot of very useful resources that started to drift through the system. It will only be in the system for a few days, but, uh, I mean, apart from anything else, it's got a very large amount of Benamite on it. Benamite, and class M, it looks like. Sorry, Pri, I interrupted you. Uh, I just said, in class M, it looks like. Mm. And even more startling, 
a chance of probability, considering a rogue planet spends much time in the coldness of deep space. Yes. It must have very... trem tremendous thermal pockets of geological activity. Hmm. Uh, very curious. And uh, Lena, at this point, does take a look at the data as well, and the ambassador says, uh, Captain, uh, honestly, the Atlantis didn't have a flight plan ready. They were simply going to choose a second star on the left type scenario. Uh, would you mind if the Atlantis tagged along as well? Uh, what? Sounds like a plan to me. Uh, uh, Mertron will sort of con the Atlantis and uh, say, uh, Captain Mertron to Atlantis. This is Captain O'Sheen. Go ahead, Captain. So, um, we think we found uh, an interesting little target for your uh, first excursion into interstellar space, and he'll sort of send the data over. The Amalthia just discovered this. Oh, no, sorry, no, not the Amalthia. The Lysithia just discovered this. Hmm. Well, this will be an excellent chance to further test our high-resolution sensors. Uh, obviously, I, I don't think they're as advanced as some of the, the sensors that you have in the fleet, but I believe we will be able to assist you all the same. All righty, then. All right. On, on your mark, then, Captain? Indeed. And uh, she... Again, because you have to remember, Marissa don't have mouths, and they, they communicate telepathically, so you do see her head slowly tilt to the right... And then tilt back and said, we're ready to go uh, at the Lysithia's command. Uh, I'd like to uh, calm the Ophion in order them to follow. All right. I forget. Uh, that was Locke who was first officer now, right? Yeah. Correct. Connect to Ophion. Locke here. We're going on a bit of a, uh, just the FTF, a field trip. Please fall into uh, into formation and follow us to this destination and a couple of button presses and I'll send the coordinates out. Hi, Captain. We'll rendezvous with you there. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, uh, all of you begin to move towards your different stations. Uh, the three ships, the Ophion, the Lysithia, and the Atlantis, uh, sort of fall into formation and begin heading towards this rogue planet. Um, but before we start to deal with the rogue planet, I would like to have uh, Prier, as you return to sickbay, uh, it has been suspiciously quiet. Uh, Jensen is not there. Uh, Jensen hasn't been seen in sickbay for over, actually... Four days at this point, and that's rare for that's Jensen. Rare. I don't trust it. Something is wrong. Jensen is healthy. I was. Lo I'll look through my paperwork. I think it's time I make a house call. <laughs> so and walk out of sick bay and start heading towards Jensen's quarters. Okay. So uh, my question is, uh, and this is sort of a. A question to the group at large. Uh, what do we believe that uh, Jensen's quarters would look like? An absolute mess. I'm, I'm predicting, predicting sharp knives, knives all over the all place. Over place. <laughs> Probably some needles. I mean, um, it, would, it would have to be either an in, um, incredible mess or meticulously ordered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm for meticulously, meticulously ordered myself. Yeah, That's how spotless. I do. Smelling of antiseptic and uh, uh, rubbing alcohol. All right. Well, uh, you proceed to his quarters, and uh, when you chime the door, uh, you do hear a voice that says, "Come in." And uh, when you step in, Prier, uh, you see that uh, the lights are off, and the only illumination in these quarters uh, is candles. And the more you look around, the more you realize and your senses indicate that uh, these are not only scented candles, but the scent, the type of candle, is the same kind used in Vulcan meditation techniques. And you see uh, Jensen. Oh, no. oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I'll, 
I was just saying. No, I was just saying. Oh no. Ah. Um. So you see Jensen. Uh, he is currently seated, uh, cross-legged on the floor before his couch, and uh, he appears to be meditating. Lieutenant, I was a little worried about you. I haven't seen you. Uh, yes, Doctor. I came across a Vulcan med- uh, meditation technique, and I thought it might help with my headaches. Interesting. Has it? Uh, somewhat, yes. It, it has helped focus my mind. Well, that's good to hear. It's strange not seeing you in sickbay. Well, as much as I appreciate your uh, doctor's touch, as it were, uh, there are problems that uh, I wish I could solve myself. And uh, he begins to stand up and says, Computer, please, uh, normal illumination. And, uh, of course, as Jensen stands up, I spend threat, and he trips over himself, (laughs) falls into the table, shattering it completely, and he is now on the ground going, Ow, doctor! Let me look at you, taking a deep sigh and pulling out my tricorder. Alright, roll me a reason medicine, difficulty zero. Uh, would sensor operations or research methods work? It's Jensen, so both. He's a special <laughs> case. <laughs> oh, one success. All right, hey, that's one momentum. Uh, so he's fine. He, you know, he maybe has some superficial cuts or bruises. It's, it's nothing major. But what you do detect is that there is uh, a slight imbalance in his neurochemistry. Uh, It's nothing serious, but this might explain why he's having uh, headache problems. Jensen, how long have you been having these headaches? Uh, Ever since we got to the Gamma Quadrant? It didn't happen prior? No, as soon as we got flung out of that wormhole, I've, I've almost had like a constant headache. Interesting. I'm not s- detecting anything to be too concerned about, but there is a slight imbalance in your neurochemistry, which could explain your headaches. And Jensen's eyes sort of narrow. Do, do you think it could be maybe related to why I keep tripping over things? Or, or maybe it's Q. Maybe Q keeps putting tables in front of me, and I don't see them. That table was plainly there, Jensen. Um, I'm thinking it does have something to do uh, do with your uh, equilibrium problems. You, you don't think it might be a holodeck thing? Like, like I, I've heard about it. It's holodeck psychosis. Uh, uh, what was what was the name of that guy? Uh, Barkley. I heard Barkley had something similar to this. You and Barkley are one in the same. Why don't we go down to sick bay and do some tests and see if we can figure out the reason behind our strange um, imbalance. Of course, Doctor. And yeah, uh, the two of you head to sick bay. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we're going to cut back to... Uh, let's go to the Bridge of the Amalthea. It, in before we bounce too close to the Galactic Barrier and he's a latent psychic. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, you know, since uh, I have not been told to the contrary, uh, all the Amalthea senior staff is at their post. And, uh, and Rosazo, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, how many shifts do you have your security personnel on? Imagine what a loaded question. Standard three rotation. We're with three rotation shift, correct? I mean, that's entirely up to you guys. It's also why I asked the question. Yeah, I'd imagine they'd stick to the three rotations. It's because he has. Um, <laughs> when asked about it, Zazu would be look confused and be like, "You, you sleep every twenty four hours." <laughs> All right. That seems inefficient. Hmm. I go thirty six myself. Um, well, uh, the reason I ask is because we'll say midway between second and third shift, so between beta and gamma, um, you 
are getting a report from uh, one of your security personnel that they have found someone in the corridor uh, that has collapsed. And while it doesn't appear that there's any foul play involved, it is one of those things that you do get a report about. So, I, I, I sign a security guard to look at it, investigate, hunt, escort them to the med bay, stay with them. Mary? Acknowledge the report and continue. Gotcha. And uh, at the same time, uh, Derval, uh, I have sort of the same question for you, uh, since you're kind of leading the flight ops for the fleet, or at least for the Amalthea. How many uh, rotations do you have for the flight crew? I would suspect three rotations. Okay. So, uh, you know, you're, you're getting standard reports. Uh, however, uh, right before you uh, maybe stop and, you know, take a break yourself... Um, you do notice that uh, one Sona, your, uh, the flight deck operator, uh, has sent you a report detailing the repairs uh, to the Callisto classes. And out of character, uh, I decided that uh, you guys can potentially use the uh, year supply for each Callisto to repair the breaches to a Callisto. Now, that's, it's not going to take, like, the full year supply. Uh, it would take about two months' worth of supplies for the Callisto to repair one breach. Okay. That's probably a good thing. I'd go for it. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's housekeeping, but we I did want to do it while it was fresh in everyone's minds. Um, I believe it was the Ganymede that got the breaches. Yes, there's one to the yeah. breach for the Ganymede. IO has several. Yeah, it looks like actually everything but the Europa has a breach. We took a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they took punishment, so we didn't have to. Okay. So I'll say this much, um, because you have a starbase in the area, and because, you know, I've said that you can do this, um, <laughs> if you specifically note that for each ship you have spent X amount of supplies of your year supply, you can repair all the breaches to your Callistos. So for example, the actual USS Callisto would take four months of your twelve. I think that would be a worthy investment. What do you guys think? Well, it's going to mm -hmm. be burning the lines pretty fast, but we need those ships. Yeah. Yeah, we need them up and running, so yeah, let's spend that. Okay. We definitely want to get that refinery started at some point, though. Yeah, we have a star base now, and it looks like we're going to, we might get some more resources, so, so yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. I, actually, that was something I forgot to mention in the captain's report, is the Helium-3 mining facility is on the way to complete it. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, I think the timetable, if I remember what I wrote for the log uh, correctly, it's going to be operational within a few weeks. Let me look that up. Uh, yep, uh, within two weeks' time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, it is at this point that we are going to... Let's go to the bridge of the Lysithia, because I think the Lysithia has taken the lead on this one. And what was the is... status of installing the Romulan cloak on the Yofi? Uh, I'm going to say that uh, you do have the Romulan cloak. Um, it doesn't actually count as a talent, but you do have the ability to cloak. And what I'll say in regards to multi-vector assault mode is that only alpha section will cloak. Alright. Does he got to store it somewhere? Mm-hmm. So is that even if they're uh, all connected, only alpha section will cloak? Oh, no, no, no. Like, well. if they're connected, the, the whole ship does, but when they're split <laughs> apart, it's only, only the alpha section. Alpha. Just wanted to clarify. Engineering, cloak the ship. Front of the ship disappears. <laughs> <laughs> They'll never see us coming. <laughs> oh dear. But yeah, uh, Beckett, the uh, the mini fleet is awaiting your orders. Uh, Miss Swan, bring us along so that way we can get a little bit deeper scans of this 
ball of rock. I am Mar plotting a course. Margoth will definitely be looking at this interest with a close eye. Um. Hmm. Well, seeing we said it in Discord, <clears throat> and it was funny. Uh, Commander Ty, uh, how do you feel about getting out and stretching your legs? Part of my physical routine every morning includes good stretching, sir. Oh, you're referring to heading down to the planet f and uh, assembling an away team? Yeah, maybe I should have asked how you are with your uh, uh, EV training. Um, but yes, I meant going down to the planet. Very well, sir. I'd like to make a, a preliminary survey from the ship first to make sure we're landing somewhere safe. Absolutely, Lieutenant. Right. I mean, thank you, thank you, Captain. So, uh, what I'm going to say on this is because you have the unique position of three ships uh, essentially scanning the same ball of rock, um, this is going to be a very simple extended task. Now, what I will say is that for each roll is going to be a different ship. So, we're going to do three attempts here. And whatever number of work you've got done, if it's enough to uh, complete the extended task... I'll give you certain information, and if it's not, you'll still get information, but not maybe the whole thing, if that makes any sense. Um, so we will start with the Lysithia. So, Margoth, I need you to roll me a Reason Science, and the Lysithia will assist you with Sensor Science, and the base difficulty here is a 4. Now, if I remember correctly, you also have Advanced Sensor Suites, so yep. that would be reduced to 3 for the Lysithia. Okay, and I'll get the ship. You said sensors and science, yes? Correct. What was the difficulty? Four, you said? Uh, it is three because you have advanced sensors. <clears throat> Alright, we have an assist from the ship. Very nice, you get one momentum. Nice. And, uh, yeah, Mar Margoth, if you would now roll me six challenge die to represent the work you do. My uh, all fingers and thumbs gets me a bonus momentum that only I can... Well, you cut out there. What can it be used on? Oh, it's just like a regular momentum, only it's a pull strictly for Margoth. Gotcha. I, I drew a card, but it disappeared. I don't know where it went. Hmm. Well, I'll remember it. I got it. Mm -hmm. Um, six challenge dice. Correct. Very nice. That is enough for a breakthrough. So, Margoth, uh, as you're scanning the planet, you realize something actually kind of wondrous. Uh, at first, you know, when you when you approach the planet and began to sort of orbit it, uh, it seemed just like a dark ball of rock. But when you switch the sensors to look at, say, the ultraviolet spectrum the planet lights up like a light bulb and you see that there is a significant amount of not only flora but fauna that are living in indeed a class m atmosphere captain this is quite astounding there's this whole ball of, uh, this whole planet seems to be teeming with life which is odd for a rogue planet and I'll kind of put it up on the main screw and then switch to uh, ultraviolet. Mm -hmm. Main screen. I mean. Well, isn't that something? Any uh, indication of civilization or in intelligent life? That would be a no. Not that I can detect, Captain. No, no forms of advanced uh, configurations of biological life. And, uh, I mean, I understand it's a Class M, but the atmosphere and gravity and all of those things would be not terribly hostile for an away team? What would the answer to that be? I mean, yeah. I assume not. I, as far as I can tell, sir, it is all systems go. Unless there's some sort of man-eating man uh, plant or running into local wildlife. Uh, Commander Ty, how about you take uh, uh, Lieutenant Margoth and High Long and uh, 
anyone else you see fit and go down there and see what you can find out. Maybe the doctor that specializes in botany. Maybe yes, also sir. our doctor who happens to be a botanist. <laughs> a wise idea. Lenaro also has a focus in metallurgy if you want to take him down to scan for the ores. Sure, send all the PCs off the ship other than me. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let me uh, let me get the tokens right here. So uh, Ty is going. Uh, Margoth is going. Yep. Margoth, Lenaro, Scrim, please join me in the transporter room. Um, right. Lieutenant Svarja. Margoth also has bot name, by the way. Geology, yeah. exotectonics, and research. Excellent. Science! Hooray! Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, Lieutenant Sparja, please come. Please join us as well. Yes, sir. And I believe that's one for everyone. Uh, I count five people. Ah. Uh, I believe Beckett it needs someone, and uh, yeah, someone who's who's missing here. Uh, I think, yes, Bishop needs to either play Sparja or bring a character of his own. Uh, uh, Swan, Swan will be flying the Lysithia, so probably Svarja. Okay, yeah. Right. Um, who it. does Beckett want to bring? Um, I'm fine to sit on the ship. Okay. All right, fair. All right, so uh, an away team is assembled for uh, at least the Lysithia. Uh, but before you beam down, we're going to sort of jump ship to the Ophion. And Locke, it is now your turn for a reason plus science. The difficulty is a one, I believe, because you have advanced sensors, and because of the breakthrough, uh, the difficulty, or no, it would be a difficulty two. Uh, the breakthrough knocks it down to a base three, advanced sensors knocks it down to a two. So yes, uh, you would be rolling a reason plus science, and the Ophion will assist you with a sensor science. Grab the Ophion. Focus. Again, the focus it would definitely be a focus, yes. Could Mito assist with his sensor operation focus? I'll let it happen, sure. Grab, just grab the sheet. What was the Ophion's role? Sensor science. Oh. Alright, no help from the Ophion, but you do get help from Mito. Uh, so go ahead, Locke, and roll me, uh, what is that for you? Seven challenge die. Very nice. So, uh, what the Ophion detects with its pass is that uh, there are indeed these sort of thermal vents that are keeping the planet heated. Now, you know, it's still probably a, a chilly 50 degrees Fahrenheit or, God, I forget what that is in Celsius, something like, is that 15, 20 Celsius? Celsius. That might be a bit high. Uh, well, what's, uh, what's body temperature in Celsius in Fahrenheit? 90 degrees. Ninety-eight point four. Fifty degrees equals right. ten degrees. Celsius. So that's probably that's probably somewhere around twelve degrees Celsius then. Okay, so you know we'll, we'll say for sake of argument somewhere between twelve and fifteen degrees Celsius. No, it's, it's, right. it's, it is exactly ten, thanks to Google. Thank you, Google. Thank you. Um, but yeah, uh, the planet, uh, most of the larger forests, as you're seeing are surrounding these thermal vents. Now, obviously, the farther you go out from these vents, it does get colder and there's less plant life, but it's not, say, class L level where you would have to start taking, say, triox injections or cold weather gear. You know, it, it is still habitable. It's just not as pleasant. Dress warmly. Starfleet uniforms are... Versatile. I bet you spacesuits might be good. Those those really sleek Discovery era spacesuits where the, the helmet can just retract. <laughs> right. Yes, why they decided to uh, improve them into giant bulky things as technology improves. Who knows? It's the same yeah. science that went into Spock's helmet. We may never know. Few yeah. points of failure. All right. Uh, so my question is: uh, Once the Ophion and once Locke, you've reported all this. Uh, what is the call from Panek? Is he going to send an away team as well, or is he just sort of standing by? I look over at. Um, well, actually, Panek on. Is Panek still on the captain's yacht, or did he go back to the Ophion? I figured I would have transported over the Ophion. Who? Nope. I look over at Locke, and I would engage his his interest in 
going, you know, just kind of get a read off of Well, um, there's the science team going down already. I think we'd be better served here monitoring and getting ready to beam them out if necessary. Behind those thermal vents. Very well. Uh, an astute observation. Uh, Ophion to Lysithia. <clears throat> Lysithia here. Go ahead, Ophion. Ophion will be playing backup in this in this situation. We'll provide support and beam out if necessary. Very well, Captain. Good to have you behind us. All right. So, uh, one more thing before we fly down and see what's going on with the away team. Uh, I would like someone to roll me a 2d20, please, and this will represent the crew of the Atlantis doing their own task. Two and seven. Two and a seven. Wow. That is very good for Ooh. them. Uh, let me go ahead and roll their sensor science and see if that gets you anything more. Look at Ooh. that. Nice. So you guys actually go up two momentum because of that. And yeah, uh, with the Atlantis, uh, they sort of go into a lower orbit than the rest of you uh, because obviously their sensors aren't as powerful. However, they are very, they are very quickly able to uh, pinpoint the locations of a large deposit of Benamite. Now, the rest of the deposits are still there, but the fact that they've pinpointed this Benamite deposit is, you know, good because you have a location you could beam down to. Um, and of course, uh, Oshin does tell you all of this. Um, so my, my main question, I guess, leading into this is, where would the away team like to beam down? Would you like to be near your event? Would you like to be near the deposit? Would you just like to be anywhere random on the planet? I think near event would be a good starting point. It gives us a nice central f landmark to uh, to start from. Margoth would also like to chime in and, and say that the event would also give us the great, a greater um, survey of the general life in, on the planet, since they would be kind of cloistered around them. Agreed. Okay. So we'll say you beam down to a vent, and I will put you on this map and describe what you're seeing. So immediately, uh, as the blue shimmer uh, around the away team begins to lessen, you find yourselves in a bioluminescent, almost tropical paradise. Uh, everything is lit up, like all the plant life here is glowing in some fashion. Um, obviously, that big old gas giant in the background isn't there. Um, but what you're seeing is that all of the light uh, from all of these plants is enough that even those of you with, uh, shall we say, human standard vision, uh, you're able to see somewhat well. It's, it's, I would qualify it as almost a, uh, a full moon style light uh, out in the countryside. Um, and... The noise is what you might expect from a rainforest. Uh, you're hearing clicks of insects. You're hearing the cause of what might be birds. Uh, you hear the trickle of water as in the distance you see a waterfall crashing down and cascading from high cliffs. And in all, it's, it's a mesmerizing sight. Well, Svarja and I shall secure the perimeter. Um, the rest of you, please begin survey operations. And Scrim, please do not eat anything this time. It's, I never eat anything without scanning it four times. Because he sets yes. on a very, very large specimen case. It starts looking for spores and samples. Cutting. All right. I'll draw my phaser and have a tricorder in the other hand and start just drawing a big circle looking for big critters that could be a threat. Sure. Uh, roll me uh, a reason security, and I would say that Sparja will assist you with her own reason yep. security. security. Right. That goes. Uh, that that is her thing. All right. I have the reason fields. security. Mm -hmm. yeah. Security. I have would survival. Like, would like to get detailed scans of this event. Okay. Let's resolve the. Uh, let's resolve the security one first. Um, okay. And well, you rolled tie. Did you mean to roll tie? Uh yeah, I am Commander Tie. 
Oh, well, I, I, I just meant... Oh. Uh, oh, I sorry, I got characters mixed up. You're right. Um, yeah. So yeah, uh, you actually guys are going to be capped at momentum with one floating. And uh, what, you know, you're scanning the immediate area and you're finding that there are maybe, say, cat-sized uh, little beasties <clears throat> running around, but you're not seeing any larger creatures or anything that you would think constitutes a threat. Uh, however... As uh, you're doing the scans and as Margoth takes out his tricorder and his scrim starts taking samples, um, a very, almost like a hush sound of wings flapping uh, catches the attention of Svarja. And Svarja looks up in time and sees that a, a falcon-sized bird of some sort, um, it has four wings... And it is flapping down and making to look like it's trying to land in your immediate area. Um, so this is about a bird, maybe about the size of a, uh, a human's forearm. Um, and it is brightly colored and glowing. Uh, it has almost like spots of glowing material throughout what appear to be feathers and other soft down. Well, just as well as small, otherwise Svaja probably would have shot at it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, as yeah. Oh, no, she, she will basically just draw a bead on it and watch it as it comes down. Okay. Well, assuming none of you shoot it, uh, it comes to light on a uh, branch nearby overlooking where you guys have come down, and it just sits there and stares at you with that sort of bird of prey, uh, steely glare. Um, for that one floating momentum, can I use it to ask a question? You certainly may. Uh, the composition of the trees, are they wood, or are they like a, some sort of elaborate fungus? That is an excellent question. The answer is that they are indeed more like a fungus, because uh, if they were traditional plants, probably would not be getting the sunlight they need and things like that, so definitely more like a fungus. All right, I'll pass that finding on to this, the people who know more about science than me. Interesting, interesting. Hmm. So they're more fungal clusters, yes. These are giant colonies. They just happen to resemble trees. Hmm. It's like taking scrapings and samples, mm -hmm. putting things of dirt in it. And uh, as you, you know, you guys continue to scan, fan out, find resources, um, the bird uh, chirps. And for a moment, none of you think anything of it. It's just, hey, it made a noise. Um, but I need to ask, who has the highest con score here? Uh, con Not me. I have a three. Baja has three. Margaret's got two. <clears throat> All right. Well, anyone with a con score of three or higher, something about that chirp feels odd. And if you want to do a roll, we can. Uh, but otherwise, you just sort of feel odd about the chirp. Um, nope, I've learned long ago to listen to the warning signs of wildlife. So, um, insight plus con? Yep. Or reason plus con? I would say insight is definitely applicable okay. here. Insight plus con... Nice. So, uh, it was a difficulty two, so you have another floating momentum. The sound the bird made, it seemed to have been in response to something that Scrim was doing. Like, Scrim maybe uh, plucked a branch up, or maybe picked up some leaves and put it in a sample container. Um, and the bird made a noise because of that. Scrim. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Repeat your last five actions, please, as precise as possible. And right. I'm keeping my eye on the bird. Is it actively watching Scrim? It is. Yep. Soil into container. A little bit of uh, rocky covered in mold into container. Take a clipping off a tree. All right. So it's, on. it's when you uh, take the clipping off a tree that it makes the same noise again. Hmm. Is it a distress noise or? 
I would say if you want to try and gauge if it's a distress noise, you would need to roll your own insight con. And the difficulty here would be a three. This is an alien bird from a rogue planet. Yes. I'm, I'm just going to... Uncertain. I'm just going to actually scan the bird and see if it actually detects this flora or fauna. Okay. I'd like to scan the tree he took the clipping off of when he does that. Yeah. Okay. Like reason medicine, maybe, or yeah. Let's do a let's do a reason medicine for you first. The botany is a focus, or sure. biology, okay. botany. I have, One I have, of them I have would apply. Yes. Uh, I didn't difficult. Apply wow, very nice. Wow. I did not apply my focuses. So that was two natural yeah. ones. Very nice. So I believe, chance. yeah, you have two floating momentum for which to ask me questions. Um. So. Are, Oh, is ahead. it a is it an animal? <laughs> it is indeed an animal, uh, and this this won't count as your questions yet. So it is indeed an animal, and the reason why it might be chirping is linked to the fact that you're reading that it has in that same tree that Scrim is working on. There is a smaller life sign that matches the bird's reading. Hmm. Okay. Inside the tree. Or uh, yes, sort of inside the tree, higher up from where Scrim is. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so it's probably not biologically linked, it's just, hey, that's my tree. That's the hope. Still, it's... I moved to a different tree, just to be safe. Okay. Then I'm the moment you uh, move away from the tree, the, the bird just kind of flits over to the... Uh, a uh, previously unseen hole uh, up higher in the trunk, and uh, you hear after a moment what could be the chirping of little baby birds. Hmm. Life finds a way. Margoth, what's your analysis of the fence? Sarge so is still sort of keeping half an eye on them. She doesn't trust them. Mm hmm. Uh, I'd like to roll for the vents. Sure. Uh, let's see. This will be a reason science. Uh, I'm going to make this a difficulty three. Good, because I got a talent that gives me an extra d20. Nice. Nice. Oh, and I got another talent that reduces the difficulty by one. Nice. So you have uh, two more floating momentum. Uh, so what you find is that uh, these are, you know, not quite volcanic in nature, but I would liken them more to, say, hot springs or something more like Yellowstone. Um, so, like, the immediate area around the vents is a little bit more acidic than you might want to deal with, but on the whole, that they are stable. It doesn't seem like there's any risk of an eruption of some sort. Um, and that this also is probably the source of the oxygen uh, that you're breathing right now. Not only the fungus, but the vents are producing uh, a suitable atmosphere as well. If Could I burn a momentum, uh, one of the free, uh, free momentums, to ask whether or not it's stable enough that once we start, if we start mining... Could it destabilize the tectonic plates here? That is a very important question. Uh, I will say that as long as you are careful with your mining operations, that it will not be a problem. I imagine the ecosystem on this planet is incredibly fragile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From what I can detect, Captain, most of the breathable air is actually emanating from these vents. Uh, the the, while the, the ecosystem seems to be rather fragile, I believe that if we limit air, the area in which we mine, and we are careful about how we go about it, the geological activity should be stable enough to proceed. Very well. Prepare as prepare as ah, prepare a series of mining surveys, and transmit them to the Lysithia and Ophion so that they can begin more thorough planetary scans. I will do that. And as you guys continue to do that, we're going to cut back to the Amalthea sickbay.
So, uh, Prior, at this point, you have uh, returned with Mr. Jensen, and you're running scans on him. Uh, I'd say you're probably about halfway through. Uh, oh, scene change, by the way. i got to keep remembering to do that, so you go down to five momentum. Um, as you're scanning Jensen, uh, about ten people kind of come in, either being carried by one of your staff or are otherwise clutching their head. This is interesting. Uh, Jensen, you mind if I go scan some of these people since we've got no random influx? Uh, sure, Doc. I'll walk over to one of the new patients and do a, with my tricorder and do a scan. All right. Uh, this is going to be a reason medicine difficulty two. And xenobiology as a focus? Yep. <clears throat> and I have I now have dedicated focus xenobiology, so when attempting attack with the focus flies, each D twenty twenty generates two successes when generating and it also generates one bonus of momentum. Okay. Cool. Alright, two successes is nice. all you need. Uh so what you learn uh before you start asking question is that yeah, strangely, even though we'll say, for example, uh, it's not just humans that come in. There's also Vulcans. There's also uh, maybe a Klingon or two. All of them are showing the same sort of neurological chemical imbalance. This is very strange. They're all showing the same signs as Jensen. Hmm. I'm going to do a scan for viruses uh in all the patients including jensen okay are you i'll say if you give me a momentum i will answer that question sure all right so what you're detecting is that there is no virus or disease as far as you can tell however there does seem to be a common theme and that theme is is that every single one of the people that has either come in or is reporting symptoms uh, is stationed on deck four, either in a working capacity or that's where their quarters are. I will uh, see those findings and immediately come down to free pack. Uh, prior to free pack. Uh, uh, what do you, what do you, yeah, free pack here and you hear clanging. Sorry to interrupt you, Chief. However, I just found something that might interest you. Uh, would you mind coming to sick bay? Interest me and in your sick bay? Yes. I'm not going to get sick, am I? Well, are your quarters on deck four? Uh, I, I, may, I get, uh, are they? <laughs> I don't really know. Let's just say, yeah, yeah, they are. <laughs> well, then you probably have a special interest in this because... All of my patients that have come in are all on deck four, and they all show the same symptoms. Okay. Uh, Anson, take over here for me. Use the 10 meter, millimeter, millimeter one. No. Yeah, okay. I'm on my way. I'm on my way. <laughs> all right. So, you know, after a dramatically appropriate amount of time, uh, you show up in sick bay. I'm, like, kind of standing away from Jensen. Just like kind of, I don't want to catch whatever. Well, free pack. It's there's nothing contagious or nothing contaminant as far as infectious diseases go. So you're safe there. All right. What, what do you? What exactly do you need? What's what is this interest that you speak of? All of the patients that have come in are all either stationed or quartered on deck four. And they all have the same neurochemical imbalance. So first, I would like to scan you to make sure that you are not, whether or not you are affected. All right. All right. So uh, to scan him, it's going to be a reason medicine difficulty two. Come on, time like latinum is a limited commodity. Oh, son Ooh, of a complication. Uh, I will say I will allow this to succeed at cost, but there will be a complication. 
Okay. All right. So, uh, with your success, you do detect that, uh, yes, he actually does also have a neurochemical imbalance. However, it's almost opposite. So, say, uh, let's, let's say, for example, uh, one of the, one of the chemicals is endorphins. Um, in Jensen and the others, it's lower endorphins. For the chief here, it's higher endorphins. It's the opposite effect. So it's still in a balance. It's just more or less than whatever Jensen and the others are experiencing. Now, the complication is, is that as you're, you know, getting the scan, uh, your tricorder literally goes dead. Well... Chief, I'm going to have to have you look at the tricorder, but that can happen later. Uh, before it went dead, the scans were saying that you also have a neurochemical imbalance. However, the opposite of what all the other patients that have come in um, have seen. Now, I can speculate that because Ferengi have a different neurochemical uh, composition than most humanoids. It's the reason why most telepaths can't read Ferengi. That would be could, the lobes for you. It definitely plays could play a factor in it. However, um, with my tricorder, and I just hold it up, being a little dead at the moment. Uh, I can't be for certain there. However, I think you and I should mosey our way down to deck four to see if we can figure out what is happening. So, prayer as you hold up your tricorder, it literally floats out of your hand and just hovers in midair. It's a fancy trick, Doc. It's a new one to me, too, Chief. Uh, I'll, I'll grab it out of the air. So you, you go to grab it, and you start tugging at it, and it's not budging. You know, I enjoy a prank as well as the next guy, but I think you're barking up the wrong tree here, Prayer. With all due respect, Chief... I wouldn't know how to affect to do this, even if I wanted to. So, Prier, I'd like you to roll me an insight medicine. Uh, Chief, I'd like you to roll me a, let's say, an insight engineering. Uh, one of you will take the lead on this, and one of you will be assisting. The difficulty here is a four, for reasons that may become apparent. Uh-oh. I'm shooting for a 13. What are you... Wait, I'm sorry, I missed that roll. The whole point about the roll, what was it? Uh, for the chief, it would be an insight engineering. So, what would your score be shooting for? Oh, God, I don't know. What, what, uh, he's going for a 13? Mm -hmm. I, I guess a 13 for me. I have no basis. I don't know what I would be shooting for. Insight engineering. What is your insight engineering score? Oh, my insight is 10 and engineering is 4. Okay, so you have one point higher. Um, so if you want to take the lead on this, the one thing I will say is that you would have the higher score, but Prier probably has a focus, so... Oh, man, I'm rolling on the wrong sheet, but I caught that. Yeah. Um... I was looking yeah. at the wrong sheet, too, sorry. I, my, uh, insight's an 11, engineering's a 5. Oh, well, yeah. You, you probably want to take the lead on this one. I've also got th diagnostics as a focus. Yeah, definitely would apply. Uh... Research methods as a focus for me? I'm going to say yes, again, for reasons that may become apparent. Just remember, it is a difficulty four task. Spend momentum. Oh, too late now. All right, I do see three successes, and... Uh, as someone has reminded me via Discord, thank you, uh, Prier is indeed in sickbay, which means he, as the doctor, gets a benefit to knock that difficulty down to a three. <laughs> so, uh, both uh, Prier and Freepak, you kind of look at the tricorder. You're trying to figure out how the hell it's, you know, floating midair and not budging. When, you know, out of the corners of your eye, you, you know, take a look at the biobed reading uh, above Jensen. And you see that Jensen's uh, neurological activity is off the charts. And it is very obvious to at least Prier, because of your medical background, 
that the only way to have those sort of levels is if you're an Esper. I walk over to Jensen. Jensen, I'm going to do an Esper rating on you. Uh, sure, Doc. Uh, whoa, what, what's going on with the tricorder? Well. And the moment we'll he says that and notices the tricorder, it falls out of the, out of the air and clatters to the ground. Apparently nothing now, shall we? Of course. <laughs> So uh, to run an Esper test, this is going to be a control engineering. Uh, the difficulty will be a three. And that's after accounting for sickbay. Oof. Um, let's see. I'm shooting for a 13, so not that great. Um, I'm going to use a momentum for a third die. Okay. And would any of my focuses come into play? Uh, I'm going to say no in this instance. Hmm. And I doubt quick study will come into play when you're attempting a task that involved an unfamiliar medical procedure. Right, yeah, because even though an Esper test is not common, it is still quote-unquote standard. Oh. All right. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, when you run the uh, the Esper test, the only thing you're able to confirm is that, yeah, he's showing Esper tendencies, but you're not able to get like a, a scale rating from it. <sighs> Jensen, you confuse me more and more every day. I confuse myself sometimes, Doc. Commander, a moment yeah. aside, please. And I just Absolutely want to walk correct. out of your shot of Je with Jensen. All right. So you find uh, a, you find a secluded corner to talk. Far be it for me to tell an officer how to do his job, especially in his abode. But uh, you know, if I was in charge of the Amalthea, which in a way I am technically, but I wouldn't want a <laughs> a bunch of confused Starfleet officers that suddenly developed psychokinetic powers running around if you get I probably think it'd be a good idea to start sedating some of these people well let's see if we can figure out where this is coming from like I said deck 4 seems to be a focal point although at this point so does Jensen so this is I'll crazy. head down to deck 4 and do what I can but this is definitely more in your wheelhouse than it is mine yeah go down to deck 4 see what you can find I'll keep working because it seemed Jensen was the first one to exhibit this as far as I could tell something tells me that it's all something going wrong with Jensen uh, word of advice commander never yes. trust someone taller than you and then I'll pat the side of my head as I'm looking down at him thanks uh, so I'm going to spend some thread here uh, free pack when you tap the side of your head uh, you literally feel something s like unseen slam into you and you stagger ah uh, uh, uh. what was that something tells me my patient and I just turn around and walk back over to Jensen alright <laughs> So you, uh, you go back to Jensen, and Jensen is just kind of, you know, being Jensen, he's holding his head, uh, you know, he's he's trying to be the best patient he can be, but he's still whiny as all hell. And uh, before we continue this scene, we are going to go back to the landing party. So, uh, by now, you guys have mapped the immediate area. You've taken quite a number of samples. And it is at this point that uh, you receive a hail from Captain O'Sheen. This is Commander Ty. Go ahead. Uh, well, Commander Ty, I'd like to report that apparently, according to our sensors, there is a rather noticeable deposit of noranium approximately a click to your west. 
I'm just going to look at Margoth and go, Neranium? Uh, would I know what that is? Uh, yes, uh, both Cormeline and Neranium, the other two deposits on this thing besides Benamite, uh, both Cormeline and Neranium are used in alloys and construction efforts. Uh, this is one of the materials we detected high deposits of alongside uh, Cormeline and ben- Benzamite, right? Benamite, yeah. Benamite. And sorry, how far away was it? Uh, one click, so about a kilometer. One kilometer. Um, how f- uh, how far does the temperate zone extend into that one kilometer? Uh, it gets to be a little bit chilly, but again, nothing that your standard uniform can't handle. Very well. The captain suggested I stretch my legs. I, s- s- I believe that this would be following his orders. Let's make for that. Let's make for that deposit team. All right. So, and then I'll re- send uh, Captain Beckett. This is Commander Ty. Go ahead, Commander. We have received location for a Noramine. Ah, what was it? Noramite. Uh, Noranium. Nor- we have received a, a location of a Noranium deposit from the Atlantis. We are. It's roughly one kilometer due east. We are heading in that direction. Very well. Noted, Commander. Uh, stay safe, and we'll keep a lock on you. Of course, sir. Landing team out. All right. So, uh, along the way, as the away team journeys, I would like everyone on the away team to roll me a fitness and a con, please. The difficulty here will just be a one. I'd like to spend my one momentum pool to get an extra done. All right. I'm probably going to need it. But uh, wilderness survival focus? It would apply, yes. Starfleet protocol? Uh, (laughs) So glad I used that. Uh, To answer your question, Preer, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say that could apply. All right. Uh, who are we missing? I think we're just missing Svarja. Oops. Sorry. What am I rolling? You're rolling fitness and con. Difficulty one. We're going on a hike. Uh, yeah, survival probably applies here. Oh, yeah. Someone carry me. <laughs> I'll go back and assist Lieutenant Margoth. Thank you, say transport me. <laughs> Alright, so all of you are fine, except Margoth. And what happens is, is that Margoth is having a tough time keeping up. Like, you continually have to slow down the rest of the group to keep him with you. And eventually, Margoth, you're, you're for some reason, you're just having a hard time keeping up. And eventually it gets to the point where you stop to take a breather, uh, maybe put a hand against a tree and you know start to catch your breath when all of a sudden you feel the ground rushing up towards you and you fall to the fl- to the, the the forest floor can I roll something to try to catch him uh you could but I would say that this is not a damaging effect all right scrim all right on it uh, it's- now mm-hmm. um, out of curiosity did Morgoth get the surgery to breathe oxygen, or is he still using his uh, gas inhaler? I believe he got the, the, the genetic engineering done. Okay. Yeah, it's, this atmosphere might not be conducive to him. Oh. It's that mercury platinum blood. Well, it's, yeah, that is all kinds of s- spores and things in the atmosphere. His body's probably not used to handling because those kind of plants don't live in his world. Well, I'll check. All right. So you're going to be rolling Roll me a, uh, a Reason Medicine, uh, difficulty three. Yeah, I think I'm going to buy an extra dice there, some of that momentum. All right. Yeah, so it's uh, I, have, I have all the focus. Uh, biology, first aid. Yeah, 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 you've got them. Hopefully one of them applies. Hey, look at that. You get uh, you get a success. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is as you suspected. Uh Though your initial scans did indicate that, uh, you know, no one would really have a problem with the atmosphere. Uh, now that you've actually seen a Benzite down here on the planet, 
your suspicions are correct in that there's just things in the environment that are interacting with his system in an unforeseen way. Yeah, it's, it's uh, nothing here is toxic or horrible, but he's got uh, what's best qualified as an allergic reaction. He has the world's worst hay fever. I'll give him some. Let's see how his plant here might act as an act- natural anti uh, antihistamine. Give me a second, I'll rub some on his upper lips and that'll maybe help a bit. Okay. So, uh, you uh, you do so, and uh, Margoth, you do feel a little bit better. Ah. ah. Thanks, Graham. Are, are you good to continue, Lieutenant? Uh, I think so. Uh, just uh, give me a second. Very well. Lieutenant Svarja, please stay close to Margoth. I, I rip off part of my uniform, my sleeve, and kind of wrap it around his face. Maybe a little bit of water on it. This should help filter out some of the the spores. Won't, it'll smell like me. It won't be nice, but it might help a bit. I honestly can't smell a thing. All right. Lieutenant Larno, please take point. Aye, sir. All right. So. Spent uh, five okay. years stuck on an app planet like this once after our shuttle crashed. Surviving on my wits. Having some sort of weird nostalgia for being marooned. I'm not sure if that's healthy or not. I spent two months on a swamp planet being actively hunted by Jem Hadar. That was fun. Please. This brings back memories. Please don't jinx us. <laughs> Suddenly, six Jem'Hadar on cloak. Oh, God. <laughs> oh my God, this is my Nam flashback. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not kidding, actually. This character spent two months on a crash planet, on a swamp world. Yeah. All right, so uh, you guys continue on after you deal with the minor medical emergency. And uh, when you arrive at the location for the deposits, uh, you see something very strange. And by that I mean, uh, normally when you think a uh, deposit of minerals or crystals or something like that, you know, they're, they're usually in the ground, uh, they're usually, you know, poking out, or, you know, they're, they're some, somewhere in, like, surrounding rock. Here, it's literally a pillar of the metal. And the pillar is perfectly send it's a perfect cylinder oh i am gonna get scans of this to see if it's a natural formation as am i all right uh, i'm a botanist and not a mineralogist but that don't seem right so uh one of you uh is going to take the lead on this and uh i would say this is a reason science and uh, that's 11 four from it Let's see. I'm going to make this a difficulty four task. My reason science overall score is an 11. Can I do a reason engineering because I have my metallurgy focus? I will allow it, yes. So who's who's leading? Uh, what is your overall score? My reason's an 11. My science is a four. I've got focuses for this in town. You can take the lead. My reason engineering is a uh, 14. All right. I reduce the difficulty of the task by one, and I get an extra d20. Okay. Out of curiosity, which talent is that? Because I know there is one like that. I just don't remember the name of it. Uh, it's the testing a theory talent, which lets me get an extra d20 when I make a similar roll to one I did before in the adventure, and then the theory into practice, which ties into the testing a theory um, Gotcha. Theory into practice was the new one introduced in the science book. Gotcha. Oh, it's, a, it's a very good combo. Alright. So, uh, that's three successes. Uh, I don't suppose one of you can re-roll one of those die, can you? Uh, if I had spent momentum, I could have. Mm. All right. Um, 
Well, then, unfortunately, I'm going to say that... Uh, I might have something. One second. Oh, go ahead. Um, just remembering my character sheets, which I closed off for some reason. I thought I have the ability to force a reroll. Wasn't the um, difficulty of four before I reduced... Oh, you're right. It, you did right. reduce it, so it is a three. All right, so you're good. Sorry. Um, so yeah, uh, what you find is that, curiously, uh, this is a natural formation. Mm -hmm. This is not showing signs of tool work or signs that this was carved out of anything of the surrounding, you know, material. It's just almost like an obelisk, like it's always been here. Commander. Yes. If, if I wasn't a bright-eyed ensign out of the academy this would be incredibly suspicious. An M-class rogue planet passing by containing just the minerals we need and now a completely just miraculously naturally formed cylinder. Cylinder. This is as far as I can tell this is, is completely natural. Well and if, as it is perfectly sticking out of the ground it would be very easy to mine. We would just need a single targeted shot with the Ophion's phaser arrays. Nick, even one of us with the phaser set to high on roughly five to ten minutes. We've got laser, bi laser bi uh, ground based laser cutting tools. We could just snip it off, essentially. Put on some uh, pattern enhancers around it and just beam it into a cargo hold. Or tractor beam it off the planet. Yes. Commander Ty to Lysithia. Uh, Lysithia here. Go ahead, Commander. We have found uh, the aforementioned uh, deposit. It appears to be very easily mineable. Uh, we're re re requesting a ground, a ground-based phaser em emplacement and several transport enhancers, please. Uh, we'll do, Commander. Uh, I'll have the transporter chief send them down as soon as we can get them together. Those are in the. Uh... Operations book, by the way, if you want to look. What page are they on for my reference? Uh, I will look it up. Cool. And probably a couple red shirts to do all the, you know, dirty mining work so that we can continue the gl more glamorous task of exploration. Right. So, my question is at this point is, how long do you guys want to spend on further uh, exploration? Because remember, there is sort of a time limit here where if you're going to do anything to capture this planet, it's going to have to happen soon, because you only have a, a limited window to act. They're page 54. Page 54, thank you. Well, um, this uh, deposit, how much, or how, t how big around is it, and how tall is it? I would say it is approximately uh, two meters in diameter, and we'll say about four meters in height. Okay, so not that... Well, okay, that's roughly, what, 16 cubic feet? Maybe a bit, probably more. My math is not good. A little more than that. Uh, two meters diameter, whatever. Um, yeah, so... Assuming this isn't the only deposit, yes, I would recommend... Uh, Commander Ty to uh, Captain Panek. I mean, it's 25 cubic meters, so... Ah. Oh, 25 cubic meters, not feet. Yes. The neck here. We believe that there is enough on this planet that we can mine without damaging its ecology. I'd like to... Uh, I'd like the Ophion to prepare a tractor beam solution that we could potentially make this planet immo no longer rogue, sir? Uh, I will see what we can get together with the Lysithia. Thank you, Captain. I, I believe it would be prudent for you to not be on the surface of the planet when we do so. Agreed. We are doing a little bit of expl exploratory mining. However, we, by my rough estimate, we still have two days before this planet leaves system entirely. Actually, uh, well. our window here is more like a few hours. Oh, a few hours. Okay. Um, never mind with the mining operations, uh, Captain. I was... Never mind. I'm operating on a completely different time scale. Right, I might not have been clear, and I apologize for that. Okay, um... 
Commander Ty to Captain Beckett. Go ahead, Commander. Uh, please belay my last request, Captain. I believe it more prudent to capture the planet before we do exploratory mining. Uh, very well, Commander. Uh, let me know when you guys are ready to get off the planet. Um, I just look around at the rest of everyone to uh, gauge what their reactions are. Hmm. It is a very geologically unstable planet. If we do try to track your beam, it might cause significant earth tremors and quake. Very well. We are we are standing by to beam up Lysithia. We'll prepare the tractor beam solution in orbit. All right. So, uh, as the away team beams up, I think this is the perfect opportunity for us to take a five to ten minute break. So, right, so. we will BRB.
All right, and we're back from our break. So, uh, as you can now see on the screen, we have a lovely system map. And this scene is going to play out uh, across the Lysithia, the uh, Ophion, and the uh, Atlantis. Uh, basically, all three ships will be contributing to this conversation, so you can speak up as any NPC or supporting character that you uh, would wish. But uh, what I have to tell you, sort of uh, what we sort of discussed during the break, so that on stream people know. So as you can see on the on the map, there are two systems. There is Suthia, the uh, water world where the Marissa call their home, and there is the big old Class T gas giant uh, that is out further out into the system. Now the yellow dot you're seeing on the right hand side of your screen is where the rogue planet is coming in at a right angle to everything. And in order to uh, correctly capture it is what we're discussing, is how to maneuver it in such a way that uh, would allow it to, um, you know, not mess up the, the rest of the dynamics of the system. And we're just going to start with a, a meeting of the minds. So whoever would like to speak up first. Considering the speed at which the rogue planet's moving through the system mm -hmm. any any orbit we put it into is ten, tends to be is going to tend to be a highly elliptical orbit it's going to have a huge apoapsis and periapsis yeah so I'm, I'm thinking it might almost be smart to like do a two stage maneuver where we do the initial capture maneuver to get it stuck in the planet's gravity well and then we sort of go out, catch it at apoapsis, and push the periapsis out so it's, like, outside the orbit of all the main planets. Seconded. Yes, yes. Um, we should definitely do it in multiple stages, especially since it is a, a planet full of life. The less stress we put on it, the less chance of it violently shaking apart at the theme. A sort of feathered approach to the tractor, not a sustained burst where we yank it, but a slow, steady... To do, to do, to do, to do, to do, like pulsing a slow put. It might almost be better to separate the Ophion into multiple, into multi vector assault mode and use it multiple track dreams at different angles as, in addition to the Amalthea. Get it, from a, uh, get it from a kind of four quadrants of gentle shoving. Uh, let's see. Splitting the Ophion would give us four ships with the Lysithia, so that would <clears throat> give us the ability to slow it down gradually. Now, real quick, um, who has the highest science score across all of the characters on the Lysithia and on the Ophion? Uh, Margoth on the Lysithia has a four. Okay. I, I, I want to say Locke has a five. Yeah. He's also got a geology and exotectonics focus. So that, yeah, that, yeah, it's Locke only has a five, but nothing re remotely related. Uh, but that might be uh, Lieutenant Swan has a four. Four science, okay. Uh, let's see. So let's have Swan. I'd like you to do. And she does have a focus in astrophysics. That that all that will apply here. Um, I'd like Swan. I'd like you to do me an insight. Uh, in Insight Science, using your focus in Astro Navigation. Technically, it should be Insight Con, but we'll just go with Science for this one. Um, you will be assisted by either um, by Locke or by Mar or Margoth, um, and they will be rolling in Insight Science of their own. And the difficulty here is just a two... But, I don't know, it's but... a bit of momentum to bump that up to three dice. Okay. Yeah, so I think Margosh should roll it just because his focus will help. Maybe all or nothing. That was Insight Science. Am I at a bridge station? Uh, you are indeed at a bridge station. Okay, off awesome. to a good start. Oh, nice. Very nice. Okay. So, uh, you do get two momentum, which is good. Between the three of you, the ones, so Swan, Margoth, and Locke, uh, what you realize are two very important things. The first is that in order to properly capture the planet, this rogue planet, you might also need the help of another more powerful tractor beam. 
uh, i.e. the Amalthea's tractor beam. Uh, otherwise, while your pushing power is great between the three sections of the Ophion, the Lysithia, and possibly the Atlantis, um, the issue is more that if you're not careful and you don't apply equal sort of pressure on the planet as you're pushing, you could very well crack it apart. Now, the other thing I will say that you all realize more or less at the same time if this planet has been rogue and is surviving because it is not used to having a sun on it, then you might want to try and figure out a way to make it so that this sun does not destroy the ecosystem. Hmm. And hopefully that's and enough hopefully of a hint for you guys. Uh, and if it's not, just say I mean, something. Yeah, I mean, well, I... okay. Yeah, but how big is the planet itself? I mean, I would say that it is about the size of Pluto. Oh, so it's not even a real planet then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, my initial um, thought was just to capture it and have it on an extremely wide orbit. If if the um, we could either keep it on extremely wide orbit. The other possibility is that we put it uh, so that its orbit will keep it in the. Uh, gas giant's shadow for as much time as possible. Or Sorry. we could expand uh, the material. Actually, that, that is a point, actually. Mm -hmm. We could stick it in like the rear Lagrange point for the gas giant. Uh, Sorry, what was that? Uh, I was just thinking uh, a solar shield. A geostationary solar shield. Yeah, like an artificial satellite, kind of like a, a solar right. sail. But always forces are facing the thin enough. Yeah, a tidally locked solar sail blocking out because it doesn't need to be that big because it's a small planet. It just needs to be. Wide it doesn't even have to be thick, right? It just has to be wide. Yeah. Um, yeah. Plus, plus, if it's on a wide enough orbit anyway, it won't. It'll be blocking like a bright point in the sky rather than an entire sun. How strong is the star? Like, is it a yellow star like what we have on Earth, or is it uh, like a red dwarf, or is it bigger? I uh, I tried to do it to scale, which obviously it's not. Um, but the sun is somewhat on a journey to become a red giant. It's one of the it's it's so like in the fact that it's somewhere in its life cycle to where it's becoming a red giant. Um, you don't have to worry about, you know, in, unless you stay here for a couple centuries, you don't really have to worry about it affecting the overall thing. So, yeah, in the future, the Suthia planet might get a little bit hotter kind of a thing. Um, but it's not in any danger of, say, engulfing any planets anytime soon. All right. So... I was thinking more of along the lines of the amount of light output, but... Oh, that, um, so. yes, I would say it is soul-like in that regard as well. All right. but also, Which also means it has a gravity well similar to what the sun has, and that is a very large gravity well. So mm -hmm. we could also catch it way far out where it's still in the gravity well, but not affected by light, kind of like our Pluto is currently. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, it's still going to take quite a while to get to uh, get to that kind of distance. Though, in the meantime, now the one thing I will say is, uh, if you give me a momentum, I may reveal a additional hint for you guys. I'm cool with this, as am I. Yep. Right. So between the think tank. It occurs to you that if you put the planet too far out, that mining the resources would be a bit of a pain. Whereas if you did sort of tidally lock it behind the gas giant, it would be theoretically in range of the refinery station that is currently under construction. Great question is, how reliable is it to... How reliable is that process? That has yet to be determined. 
we don't want to tidally lock the planet itself. We just want to get its its orbit with in sync with the gas giant. Because if we tidally lock it, its core will start start to slow down, and then that geothermal energy that's actually giving life to this place is going to stop. Well, yeah, I think I think I, I use the the term incorrectly. Basically, yeah, if you put it in the shadow consistently, it would still be in range of the the refinery. Do we have enough time for the gas giant to get into a point of its orbit to make this? Uh, f- uh, if you had uh, about three hundred days, yeah, because the orbit of the gas giant is somewhere on the magnitude of about four hundred thirty-three days. So to get to a point where the rogue planet is close by would be quite a number of months. So you are literally going to have to drag this rogue planet across the system. This is going to be real. real tem- yeah, I'm always well tempted to just like leave it far out and just live with the inconvenience of having to warp out there to pick up stuff. Well, um, which direction is it going? Uh, south, southward on the map. Yeah, sort of south and into the screen. So it's it's should be passing pretty close, pretty close to the gas giant anyway. So we could definitely curve it in there, do a kind of a slingshot around the class T, and then kind of get into geostationary orbit from there. I think the first step yeah. should definitely be getting it in orbit of the. The central star. Yes, and then once we've established the orbit, we can nudge it as necessary. Okay. So, uh, just so I understand the consensus here, uh, I would like one of the captains, either Beckett or Panek, to confirm that you will be using the fleet to nudge the planet very carefully into a greater orbit and then once it is in a greater orbit you will be adjusting it so that it falls in the shadow of the gas giant yep that sounds right and that will turn his key in a nuclear arm device and wait for becca to do it. <laughs> uh, sort of i'm gonna make full use of the fact that the amalthia has gigantic tractor beams Mm-hmm. I think it would be best for the Opion to be providing the stabilizing force for the planet yep. while you guys put and kind of uh, um, bridge to engineer Mr. Cranston engineering here sir I want to see if you can uh, would it be possible for you to divert extra warp power to the tractor beams and establish a sort of a mi- mimic the effect of a of a stabilization field, uh, uh, an internal stabilization field like we use on the superstructure of the Uh Should be absolutely possible. I'd say give me five minutes and I'll have it ready. Very well. You have five minutes. And I'll get it done in like three and a half. <laughs> <laughs> You've thrown my timetable out of whack. <laughs> How dare you be so efficient? In it, somewhere in engineering, Cranston steeples his fingers. Yes, the plan has worked. <laughs> <laughs> We've mildly exasperated the captain. All right. So, uh, my question is, uh, which one of the captains is going to come back to Mirthrin to bring him up on the situation? I, I nudge P- P- Beckett across interstellar space with my metaphorical elbow. Jensen isn't the only one developing pa- powers. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, silence over the comms to the Amalthea is deafening, so I guess I will do it. All right. Uh, I will radio the Amalthea. Yeah, and I imagine you get in contact with Mirthra and fill him in on the details. Uh, yep, I will fill him in on the plan. Cool. And I think as long as you you can convince him that, yeah, no, we'll be able to do this without wrecking the planet's ecology, he'll be it, cool to sign off on that. Uh, I will make sure that I footnote every person who thinks that we can do this without wrecking the planet's ecology. <laughs> All right, so... 
uh, as the ships begin to get in position, we'll say that the Ophion does split into three, uh, takes up uh, equal lateral, is it equilateral? Uh, yep. Points uh, around the planet up. so that the Ophion can provide the stabilizing effect so it doesn't like go off axis or anything. And then the Amalthia and the Lysithia come in and judge where, you know, they should apply their tractor beam kind of a thing. Um, but this is going to be an extended task, and it's going to be a rather difficult extended task. So the work track is going to be a 16, the difficulty will be a 5, and the resistance is going to be a 2. Now, because we have so many ships assisting here, I'm going to say that the benefit of having this many ships is that this would bring it into the realm of possibility, meaning that if any of your ships fail a roll or roll a complication or for whatever reason run out of power, then you can no longer attempt this task, if that makes any sense. So... Uh, the other caveat is that the only assists I will allow is up to two ships, or basically two actors. So you could do both ships, uh, you could do uh, two people in a ship, uh, or you could do three people and no ship. Uh, but those are your options. Now, the actual task is going to be a control and engineering And it's I'd say the Ophion would be assisting since it's providing that stabilizing. I don't think they would be leading. Mm -hmm. Probably the Amalthia because it's the biggest. biggest. Yeah, it's providing the main motor force. Okay, well, whichever engineer uh, feels up to the challenge, you will be rolling a control engineering. Uh, it will be a difficulty five. You have two momentum at the moment, and you can be assisted by assisted two by other, other actors. actors. Yes. So, what, what's a uh, free packs control engineer? Uh, 11, 5. Ah, you're actually slightly better than Mithron. Lenaro on the last six is a 12, 5. Sorry, say again, Prayer? Lenaro on the Lysithia is a 12, 5. Ooh, control engineer. Wow. Uh, Cranston is a 10, 5. So I, I would say that if one of you took the lead and then the other two assists, you probably would do better than getting an assist from the ship. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, Lamara uh, leading, uh, free pack and Cranston supporting. Yeah, I'd say so. I don't really have a focus that helps here. Well, if anyone, Lamara, anyone, anyone have any useful talents? Can I, I have collaboration? Some... If I burn a de determination, I could. Uh... Oh wait, this is an extended task. Yeah, I've got some. I've got some extended task talent. Uh, yeah. If it's extended task, that's literally what I'm made for. Yeah, I've got miracle worker and a nick of time. As do I. I have neither of those, but I do have collaboration engineering. Um, and I can get us if we need it. Uh, I can get us uh momentum to start everything off with. <laughs> so. Nice. Uh, right. Would we would we like three extra momentum? I think that would be a good idea. The yeah. assist can't apply t talents. Uh, the the assist can apply talents, but remember they only can roll the one die. Right. All right. Okay. Um, then uh, I would like to use spirit of discovery. Okay. Uh, I will spend my determination, and it gets us three points of momentum to the group momentum pool. Very nice. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, it's, it's a dealer's choice on my values. Uh, a theory for every situation, uh, engineer at heart, underestimate, overperform. Of course, I don't look busy. I did it right the first time. <laughs> Many of those could apply. <laughs> okay. So I will spend my determination to get us three, uh, uh, three momentum. All right. You're up to five. I say free pack lead because you have the talents that assist with extended task and Cranston and Lenaro assist. Uh, if that's what you guys want. 
Sure. All right, let's, let's make it happen. <clears throat> uh, so control engineering. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to spend a momentum to get an extra die. Okay. What kind of focuses would apply? Tractor beams, tectonics, uh, mineralogy, uh, unorthodox engineering. Improvisation? Improvisation. Yeah, I don't have any. I've got jury rigging, warp core mechanics, emergency repairs, diagnostic APS, and metallurgy. Might be better metal. than if Cranston does it, because I think he's got at least a focus. Yeah, I've got uh, improvisation, starship power systems, starship computer, starship weapon systems. Plus, uh, I can still apply talent, talents as as the assist. Mm -hmm. And right. I also have the exact same talents as well. So, so do they stack? No, unfortunately, you do not get the benefits of two miracle workers. <laughs> All right, so uh, Dan, I need to get rid of this roll because I was only rolling one dice. So if I'm leading. Mm -hmm. Uh, control engineering and how many uh, dice are you rolling you would be at 5 oh, momentum then we should get a momentum yeah we get a momentum back if I'm not rolling yeah. that one. yeah so we're at 5 um, I will actually spend 3 momentum to give myself 4 dice okay um. alright well I see 2 successes on the board already very nice. Wow. Very nice. So, ding, 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 ding. so you get that momentum back. All right. So now, uh, Mr. Cranston, I need you to roll me seven challenge dice, please. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you get an additional work for every effect rolled, by the way. Well, no, it's his talents that apply to the challenge die. I, I have the same talent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have Miracle Worker and In the Nick of Time. Just make it sure. Okay. Uh, seven... Um, All right, so you would be at uh, three momentum by my count. You can spend one to re-roll those zeros. Um, and I would I would like to. Okay, so you'll go down to two momentum. And re-roll four challenge dice. <clears throat> nice. Nice. Very nice. That's better. So let's see, that is nine, ten, eleven, I count twelve work done, um, which is a breakthrough. And it's a second breakthrough because yep. of miracle work. Second breakthrough. So that's going to be 10 work done. And that will be a now difficulty three. Oh, I guess I didn't put the magnitude in there. Uh, the magnitude is also a five. So your magnitude will go down to a three. So uh, what happens is uh, with Cranston sort of leading the charge and making sure that the Ophion is uh, providing the stabilizing effect as the Amalthea and the Lysithia push, the planet, the rogue planet, begins to very slowly uh, maneuver its way towards uh, your desired orbit. Now, the one thing I will say is that as this is happening, uh, I will be rolling some challenge die to see how much power is being pulled from each ship. Um, I'm just going to roll once for the entire Ophion, then once for the Lysithia, and then once for the Amalthea. So this is for the Ophion. Okay, that's a lot of power from the Ophion. Uh, this is going to be for the Lysithia. So five from the Lysithia. And then a total of four from the Amalthea. Now, I need to know... Uh, what is the power rating for the Ophion sections? Oh, for the individual sections, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so it's going to be seven from each section. Ooh. -hoo. Let me just pop their sheets out real quick. Five. Yeah, it's going to... Yikes. All right, so obviously for the Lysithia and the Amalthia, you can just take that power away on the sheet. Uh, but for the Ophion, uh, we now have a bit of a problem. I mean, understandably, because you are providing this stabilizing effect that it's probably taken pretty much everything you got. Um, oh, I'd ahead. like to spend a momentum to create an advantage because before we started this, I ordered Cranston to divert warp core energy to the tractor beams. 
I will say because creating an advantage is two momentum, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, if yeah. you give me the two momentum that you currently have, I will reduce that by three, meaning that you will have one power remaining on all the sections. Very gracious, DM. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Which means we basically need to pull this off on the next round, because otherwise the Ophion is just going to be drained dry. Mm -hmm. Down to mood lighting. The gravity is getting lighter. All right, there we go. Now I can... Come on. Just trying to move this stupid circle. All right, whatever. I'll redraw it. All right. So your new circle uh, puts it right about there. Well, it's a square now. Yes, you um, made the planet a square. May, <laughs> may I roll a challenge dice to see if I get my determination back as Cranston is a veteran. Yes, glad you remembered. This is the only sheet I don't have veteran on the sheet, so I had to look it up. And, and I, don't, I don't. Don't think you get it back. All right. No, it has to be an effect. Uh, it was worth a shot. All right. So, same rolls, same control engineering, and I'll post it again so that you can see. You are currently at... Uh, 10 out of 16 work done. You need three more breakthroughs, and you are at a difficulty of three at the moment. Um, and in case it was brought up and I didn't hear it, mm -hmm. being the fact that uh, I am the chief engineer on my own ship, do I get the reduced in difficulty or no? You would, and we should have remembered that for the last roll, so for you it would be a difficulty too. Okay. And... Uh, we don't have any more. Um, As an assist, can I burn determination to get an extra die? Uh, no. Anyone assisting cannot use their determination or spend momentum slash threat to get additional dice. Um, hmm. Damn. I kind of want to burn one of my values to do Spirited Discovery again. Um... Ah, uh, screw it. I'll just roll straight. Roll um, straight. Well, you got two already. All we need to see is uh, one at least from you. Uh... Oh, yikes. Ooh. Okay, this is interesting. What a way to finish it. <laughs> but with difficulty two. Mm -hmm. So uh, you do get two momentum. Correct. And can I spin one to re-roll that uh, complication. Uh, no. The only way to re-roll uh, a dice is if you have uh, either cautious and bot with momentum, or threat if you have bold. Uh, or if you spend a determination to re-roll that complication. Um, we so can also spend the two momentum to negate the complication, can't we? You could, but remember, uh, you might need that momentum to uh, for the, the work done, for the work roll. Okay, then uh, I do not have bold nor cautious, so uh, I will just have to live with said complication. Okay. Because I would like to keep those two momentum just in case and for the uh, challenge dice roll. Okay. Let's just roll. remember, you're engineer on the ship that's low on power, so this complication could be really complicated. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, are we going to get the same number of challenge dice that we did before? Yes, you will mm -hmm. be rolling seven challenge dice again. And I need to get uh, what, six more successes? You need six well, more plus successes. Plus two because of the resistance. Right, okay. so you need an eight on this in order to succeed at the right. task. Right, so definitely save it to re-roll on your zeros. Right, okay. That's what I was hoping well, for. Well, I wasn't telling you differently. I'm just saying Panek is going to know <laughs> who did it, what, if it messes up. Hey, that's, that's fine. What's the worst that he's going to do? Bump me down in rank and tell me to fix the problem, which I was going to do anyways? I mean, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, I'll just keep it that way. I'll take the complication and we'll just roll with whatever it is. All right, go for it. So seven challenge dice. Wow. Nice. Wow. Ooh, wow. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 10, 11, 12, 13. Just wow. Okay. Um, we make I, a habit of this. Yeah. Can I name? Can I name what my complication is? 
I, if you give me an idea and I like it, I'll run with it. Um, I completely blew out all the power to the captain's ready room. <laughs> <laughs> You're just going to be the one replacing those EPS conduits. I don't understand what you're making it harder for yourself. <laughs> It just everything in the bridges bridges just exploding, sparks. Actually, yeah. No, would, I mean, would the captain be on the bridge or in the ready room for this? Be on the bridge. Just smoke starts billowing yeah, so, out. Of so the ready you room just door. Had, you, you just had this blam and bam shower of sparks comes out the door of the ready room. Um, <laughs> I mean either that or, uh, uh, I mean, at this point, uh, I, I would say even taking a breach. Um, yeah, that's what I'm debating, is whether or not this is breach-worthy. Um, I, mean, I tell you what, let's well, be fair about this. If I roll what? an effect on this challenge die, we'll do a breach. Okay, because I was going to say, it would make sense for breach in, in engines, being I dumped power out of uh, the engines into the tractor beams. Mm -hmm. Sense. Yeah. Well, you guys hate the Ophion now that I'm in charge of it. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that we hate it. That... Well, it's just that we don't care anymore. <laughs> no. I mean... No, it, it, it's like in the, um, the the Miles Edgeworth games where in the Phoenix Wright games, he's untouchable, everything goes right, and then as soon as he gets his own game, he's getting tied up in a chair at the back of an airplane. I, I mean, it that has nothing to do with it. It's just the bad rolls. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, so uh, the good news is no breach, but I am going to make the complication is, yeah, the captain's ready room, boom. You're going to have to fix that later. Cool. Um, but the good news is with that many successes on this task, I will say that if you guys legitimately want to park the planet in the shadow of the gas giant, you can. Let's do it. Let's do it. Pinek will stand and walk past the billowing smoke to a replicator, and he'll say, Bridge to Mr. Kranz. In the replicator? No, you can walk to the replicator, but he's going to calm Kranz. Go ahead, Captain. I'm a little busy right now. I don't think you understand how big this thing is. Is there enough power left to order a mug of Carcalian tea? There is. And I will do so, and then go back to sit at the chair. All right, so what happens is you uh, materialize, the, the T materializes, and then at that moment, I roll power to see how much power the Ophion loses. Uh, yeah, oh. everything across the Ophion goes dark. You use the last of the power for your T. You could have just left it off. You didn't have to be serious. <laughs> yeah, so, so, like, just all three sections of the Ophion just go dark and start drifting free in space. Do we, do we have no. comms? You do have, you've got auxiliary backups. I mean, it's not an issue where you're like suddenly dead in space. You just are kind of like, if someone were to attack you right now, it would be a problem. Gotcha. Uh, Cranston will uh, uh, radio the bridge. That almost kind of doesn't want to answer. Bridge here. Uh, Captain, I have put this planet exactly where you wanted it, but I need to ask a question. Can you reprimand whoever used the replicator on the bridge? Because they have completely blown out all of the power for all three decks of the ship. I'll just make eye contact with uh, <laughs> Commander Locke and go, I will see to it. Wonderful. Commander, uh, Commander Locke, can you tell the captain to stop ordering tea until after I've parked the planet? <laughs> <laughs> Not uh, uh, sure. As I, uh, I look at the tea that's floating in space, I'm I'm, I'm right. mentally mentally I'm thinking to the I'm not actually sending this mentally, but I'm thinking at lock. <laughs> you once beamed a bridge and blew up something on the bridge. I mean, you once beamed a bomb onto the bridge and blew something. Mito's a telepath; he hears it. <laughs> yes, I uh, uh, and then uh, Cranston and uh, nobody asks for any engineering for the next few hours. I will be putting our ship back together again. Uh, Mito, can you please come down to the uh, engineering? I will be on my way there shortly. Uh, on the bridge of the Amalthea. Well, let's uh, let's roll for the Lysithia and the Amalthea, because it is possible here. All right, so uh, that's six power from the Lysithia. So how much power and does And we are Lysithia? dead in the water, too. Dead in the water. Yeah. All right. And now for the Amalthea. How's the Amalthea doing? One. One. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> 
So mm. warning lights all across the all across the bridge. Mm -hmm. Captain, the Lysithia and the Ophion are have lost all power to their drives, and and are listing in space. I am detecting backups or emergency power is in place, and I am. However, the planet appears to be where it should be, sir. Hmm. Quick. Where did you guys last play see the bird of prey? Yes. Uh, uh, Rosazo, the captain. I believe the bird of prey was on patrol last I checked. Mm hmm. Captain, if this given we are all. Uh, ho hopefully he doesn't water. come back while we're getting power back to the ships, because this would be a little embarrassing. Mm -hmm. What I was about to suggest, we, we should probably launch the Callistos now. Well, the May Yuan and the Red November are also in system. Yes. <clears throat> yes, uh. Captain Merthrin to Red November and what was the other? And May Wan? May Wan here, Captain. Red November here, Captain. Yes, uh, the Lysithia and the Ophion could use a tow back to Suithia. May Yuan is en route. Red November en route. Alrighty, let's dial back on the power consumption and start building up reserves again. Uh, Gortegel swivel in his chair. Uh, Captain, uh, going with uh, Lieutenant Rosazzo's idea, I have launched uh, what Callistos are able to be launched to also act as system patrol to make sure we can get the other ships back uh, to the station. Good idea. All right. What would be an appropriate medal I could award Cranston? Uh, actually, I was going to address that in a moment, but I want to do one little quick scene before we stop the session, and then we'll do housekeeping. Um, so back in sick bay, uh, Doctor, at this point, uh, well, Free Pack is in engineering, so he's not there. Um, at this point, Doctor, you have had a chance to run another Esper test, and jensen's is off the scale jensen you confuse me more and more every day doc uh it feels weird like my body's coming apart it's like every part of me is being pulled apart That could be very much due to the Esper rating that you have, considering I have never seen a rating this high. And you're human, aren't you? But last I knew, Doc. No past relatives, telepath, empath, anything? Not, not that I know of. And it is at that moment he lets out a groan of pain and you see him double over and in a flash of light uh, his entire body uh, doesn't so much disintegrate but it turns into a being of pure energy. He just sublimates into light. Mm -hmm. And that is unfortunately where we have to end the session on a cliffhanger. <laughs> so Jensen has ascended. Yes, Jensen has ascended. All right, oh, so God. we do have to do some Jensen housekeeping, and I wanted to do it on stream so that there was a record for it later. So, uh, the question about the medals. Uh, well, let's first deal with milestones. So, because we have so many characters that we're balancing here, uh, we're going to be doing milestones a little bit differently. Um, by this point, I would say that all three of, or well, all of you as players have three milestones with which to work with. Now, if you remember, I linked a Excel, or no, I linked a Google Doc, which I'll link again and throw in resources so it's it's handy to find. Um, basically, uh, you guys can spend three, mo or three milestones to get the effects of a spotlight on any character, or you can spend six milestones to get an arc on any character. And we're going to be tracking this per player rather than per character. But we can divvy them up. 
between characters. Correct, yeah. So you can, say, spend three on one character and three on another, but the actual milestone count is tied to you guys as players. And we're now we're handling reputation differently now, right? Yes, that's where we're going to go next, and that's going to lead into the metal discussion. So the way reputation is going to work is that you all will have a 13 base, except for Panek and for Beckett, because of circumstances in the past. Uh, you two will start with a 14. Now this number will only change if and only if you do something that raises your reputation in the Gamma Quadrant. So, for example, let's say you save a civilization or you rescue some uh, ship under attack and, you know, your reputation will go up. But for metal purposes, uh, everyone, regardless of the character, unless you're uh, Beckett or Panek, will be rolling a b below a 13 to see if they gain a medal. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we're going to do is, as players, I would like each of you to roll me 2d20 and see if you get a blow of 13. Nope. Not even close. Okay, so that's two for Deku. <clears throat> okay. Alright, so, what I will say is that for a uh, free pack, free pack could potentially buy a two cost medal if uh, if Captain Mirthrin agrees on the medal. Um, for everyone else, unfortunately, there are no one medals. However, I will say that as a thematic thing, I will allow Panek to award Cranston the, where is it? It is the Cochrane Medal of Excellence. You said 13 or below, correct? 13 or below, correct. Oh, okay. yes, yeah, so you could actually also get a two, a two medal or below. And the medals start on page 97. Of which book? Of Command. So, just so we're all on the same page, so... Both uh, Free Pack and both Cranston can choose a cost two medal. In addition, Panek can also award uh, Cranston the Cochrane Medal of Excellence. Which I will. He's excellent. He is not a smarmy, sarcastic, back talking engineer at all. <laughs> I can feel the shade. Oh. Next Cochran, time, electric ship blow up. That's a cost three medal. Is the Cochrane Medal of Excellence? It is, yeah. Wow, okay, yeah, I'm, I'll definitely give it to him. All right. Now and maybe he'll forget that I ordered tea at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bribe, but you know. Uh, I will. I will absolutely forget that he ordered tea, but I will also make that that replicator is the last thing I fix. Gotcha. All right. Uh, to be fair to everyone else, though, so it doesn't feel like you know you have to roll anything. I will say that as captains, you do have the discretion to award medals that you feel make sense. So I will now ask Beckett, is there anyone on your command that you feel deserves a medal at this point? Um, the only person I can really think of would be Ty, but we really haven't done anything... Uh, yeah, I guess it would be Ty because of making first contact okay. with the uh, um, Marissa. Okay. And I, I think there is one because I think Beckett actually has the medal. Uh, there uh, is Palm Leaf of X Peace Mission, I think is I, what it is. Yeah, because I have that one for Andromeda. Yeah, um, so this would be the Palm Leaf of, we'll say, the Gamma Vanguard. Uh, I then I will absolutely give that to Ty. All right. So Ty is going to gain the palm leaf of the Gamma Vanguard that is on page ninety-eight of Command. It it basically just helps you on persuade tasks to prevent violence. Mm -hmm. uh, this with the uh, person who carries a gigantic Naginata everywhere she goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah. Hey, you didn't pull it, so you know. Yeah. All right. So the next question, Mirthrin, is there anyone under your command you feel deserves a medal? Uh, can't think of any anyone in particular at this point. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, m m most of the really big damn harrowing is bad on the other ships. Okay. Um. Pardon me. And um, Free Pack would like to to kind of he wa he wants to know if, uh, from Martha if the Starfleet decoration of gallantry would be uh, the character must have faced an extremely difficult or dangerous situation and triumphed in spite of the peril, and I'd like that situation to be when I shut down the reactor. The, oh uh, wait, no, I, no, 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 no! Yeah. Hang on, no. Free Free Pack probably does qualify. He sort of faced down a raging Tholian on his own. Mm -hmm. I right. I was actually, while he was reading the description, uh, if nothing else, because Mirthrin wasn't there, uh, uh, Drake will actually put him in for it. Alright, cool. Yeah, cool. sounds good. Yeah. Because yeah. even though I was cool. yelling at him and telling him to hurry up, he kept his cool and he got the reactor and the, the uh, booby trap shut off. That he did. I think it's a point an exploding ship full of suicidal Romulans. So yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When the most scariest thing is the intelligence officer standing next to you with a weapon telling you to hurry the hell up. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I completely forgot about that. So yeah, he definitely qualifies for that. All right. Well, in the get same that mission, too. saved what three hundred Romulans. Four hundred, I think. All right, Something so like uh, that is everything for the medals for now, I think. And, of course, if you think of one that you'd like to award, uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to visit the medals every, like, seven or eight sessions. That way it, it'll make sense uh, rather than, you know, every session sort of a thing. And I'll try to remember to hand out milestones at the end of every session. Um, so should I just note that in the, the, those two medals and the additional notes? Uh, yeah, that's where I usually put it. Uh, either that, or uh, uh, let me look at a character sheet real fast here. Uh, if you put it under uh, injuries or other equipment, that's usually another good place to put it. <clears throat> all right. That's um, where I put all the ones that Beckett has is underneath other equipment. Right. You know, just somewhere you'll remember where it is. Um, the other uh, thing that we have to decide here is how your supplies are going to be allocated for this session. So in order to get your mining station up and operational, and the mining station, because you succeeded so well, will indeed service both the rogue planet, well, I guess it's not rogue anymore, um, will service both it and the gas giant. Now, that yeah, said... said. The, the X-Men era rogue planet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now that said, you will have to give up your remaining two industrial replicators to do it. Alrighty. And then it becomes a matter of which ships still have breaches, and do you want to use uh, breaches to repair them? Uh, which ships do still have breaches? Uh, well, I know I think the Amalthia just... sensors are still messed up. Yeah. The main one still has two to the con. Come. Uh, probably focus on the May one first, and then just have the Amalthia clear them up last while it stays as sort of a home base looks like the the, 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 the Lysithia still has two breaches as well Ophion is free of breaches currently because our engineer is awesome he got a medal he got a medal okay <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah and that medal is is pretty tasty yeah, it's a very Polish long. it up, wear it around the ship for a couple of days. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna I'm wear gonna it at every it. every command staff meeting. <laughs> oh wait, sorry, I, I I thought that was Rosazzo talking and thinking. Wait, no, don't eat the me uh, eat the metal. <laughs> every every time I call a senior staff meeting, he's gonna walk in with a mug of Tarkalian tea. <laughs> and and I'm gonna and I'm gonna hand it to the captain and say, don't worry, I got it from a uh, replicator that won't blow up or you know sap all our power. <laughs> I love it. All right. Uh, okay. So I guess the question is: Do, do you want to do any repair work? Is the question. Uh, mm, I say wait mm. until the refinery yeah. is up and running, and we have more yeah. resources. So get our industrial base set up, and then we can just repair repair at leisure while we actually start exploring the Gamma Quadrant. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And that is actually uh, what we're going to discuss next, but this is all the housekeeping I want to do on stream. So players still stick around, but to any watching on Twitch, YouTube, or listening in on Podbean or iTunes, thank you so much, and we will see these guys in one week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.